Hello and welcome to the flight deck of a Boeing B-29 Super Fortress, an absolute icon of World War II. This aircraft introduced a whole range of new and interesting design features and in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour. First I'm going to start by walking around the outside, pointing them out and then we're going to crawl back here onto the flight deck and I'll show you more. So let's get into it. I make videos about planes and some rockets. If you enjoy trip reports on board flights around the world and tours through interesting aircraft and museums, then check out my channel. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Let's start at the nose gear of this B-29. What's interesting is that there's no steering input. In fact, you could only turn the aircraft on the ground via modulating the engine speeds and using the brakes. Another interesting fact is that the wheel brakes is the only hydraulic component on the whole aircraft, as everything else was electric to save weight. Now looking up, you've got the bombardier's position. There was a Norden bomb site in front of him, although to his right, and you'll see this once we're inside, was a gunner's site that could swing in front and allow him to use the upper and lower turrets remotely. And speaking of those, you can just make out the forward upper turret, and here's the forward lower turret with the two 50 caliber Browning M2 machine guns firing at 14 rounds per second. This was a huge upgrade from the B-17 where the turret would have a man physically sitting inside of it who would be firing it. This one could be used remotely by any gunner who had the best view of the enemy, including the bombardier who we saw in the nose earlier. And here we are in the forward bomb bay. You can make out the large pressure bulkhead with a central circular window, which we'll be looking through shortly, and above that is the pressurised crew tunnel and those yellow tanks interspersed around the place were oxygen tanks. This large bulge underneath was the ANAPQ-13 radar, which had a range of around 70 to 100 miles, and here we are in the rear bomb bay. It could hold up to 20,000 pounds of weapons, although it was often the fuel requirement that resulted in a decreased payload. Both the Nagasaki and Hiroshima atomic bombs weighed just under 11,000 and 10,000 pounds respectively. It's interesting to contrast the size of this bomb bay with the much smaller B-17, and my video inside that will be in my channel shortly. Now another advance with the B-29 when compared to the older B-17 were improvements with the aerodynamics. The much smaller and smooth gun turrets helped dramatically, but also using flush rivets on all air wetted surfaces versus the protruding head rivets that you can see now on this B-17 footage. They also ensured that all panel joints were much smoother as well. In fact, even though it was considerably larger, the B-29 generated the same amount of drag as the B-17. Here, you've got the exhaust for the APU, which was a 10 horsepower auxiliary power unit, and below that is the aft lower gun turret. And finally, we're here at the tail. Down here is the tail strike skid in case the crew rotated too aggressively. There's two inch thick armoured glass protecting the rear gunner and you can make out this escape door. The control surfaces including the rudder, elevator and the ailerons were all cloth and were so well balanced and geared that they didn't require any additional power to operate them. As I said earlier, only the wheel brakes used hydraulic assistance. Now let's wander forward again and past the left blister sighting station. The pressurised cabin and analog computer controlled fire control system were huge advances at the time. In fact, the whole development and production cost $3 billion, which when adjusted for inflation would be $43 billion. It far exceeded the $1.9 billion cost of the Manhattan Project, making it the most expensive single project of the entire war. In fact, it was such an impressive design that the Soviets captured one and then reverse engineered over 800 of them, calling it the Tupolev Tu-4. Here's the main landing gear, which, like most aircraft from that era, folded up into the engine cowling, rather than into the main fuselage, allowing space for the bombs. Now, unlike the B-17, which was a tail dragger design, the B-29 was the more modern tricycle setup, with the main landing gear and then the single gear at the front. Now let's have a look at these four Wright R3350 18-cylinder radial air-cooled turbo supercharged engines. Now overheating was a big problem with this engine, and you'll see these cowling flaps here could be opened, which exhausted hot air out and enabled cool air to enter from the front. But they also increased drag, so it was a fine line to take. Each engine had two turbochargers and one supercharger, which maintained manifold pressure, especially at high altitudes, and provided vital extra power on takeoff. And it's partially obscured by the propeller here, but 
Below that was the Ram Air Inlet for the air cooler, carburetor and the cabin air. So the B29 introduced a new level of crew comfort with cabin pressurization. That pressurized air was bled from engine 2 and 3 turbochargers, so it would actually decrease those engine performances. Coming directly from the turbochargers, the pressurized air could also be very hot, so this intercooler ram air scoop could ingest cold air from the atmosphere to cool the pressurized air down, although this intercooler could be bypassed if heating was desirable. These vents here, just below the exhaust stubs, were for the turbochargers, which could be rotating up to 20,000 RPM. And the propellers were four bladed Hamilton standard constant speed with full feathering capability. They rotated at 35% of the engine speed to keep the tip down below Mach 1. Here's the wing, and as you can see, the fabric covered ailerons are a slightly different color. Now let's go and check out the interior and on the way you'll notice the black device on top and that was the ADF navigation antenna. Now this display has been risen up to allow museum visitors to look underneath the aircraft so such a tall ladder wouldn't usually have been needed. The main crew entrance was inside the forward wheel well as you can see here. As we make our way up you'll notice how unusual the shape is as it's completely round like a submarine. This was because circular shapes were easy to use with pressurization, as the pressure could be shared across the entire area rather than specifically at corners. Let's crawl forward into the bombardier's position where you'll see an incredible view. There's a fan in front of you because remember that a lot of these operated in the Pacific conflict where the interiors would have been like a glass house in those very hot and humid climates. On the left there are the controls for the bomb release and briefly before the drop, this guy would actually control the aircraft's heading. In front is the Norden bomb site, which the Americans were very careful to keep secret, not knowing that German spies had actually infiltrated the manufacturing plant years beforehand. And to the right is the gun site, which could be pulled around in front of the bombardier, and then he could remotely use multiple other turrets to fire at the same target. It really was impressive engineering for the time. Now we'll spin around and I'll jump into the pilot seat. And what an incredible privilege it is to crawl around one of these aircraft and get views like this, looking back at engine 1 and 2. And of course, being a hopeless millennial that I am, I couldn't resist taking a selfie while sticking my head out through the window of a B-29 Super Fortress. On the left here are the four blue engine throttles. Now the pilot would use these in addition to the braking to steer the aircraft on the ground because remember there's no nose wheel steering. Then the pilot would start the takeoff process but then hand over the throttles to the engineer who would maintain them until they've landed. They'd be calling out what they want but otherwise it was decided that the pilot had enough to do by just flying the plane. In front you'll notice that there's just the manifold pressure and RPM as managing the engines and systems was all the flight engineer's job. There actually was a surprising lack of dials there. And down on the pilot's right hand side were emergency brakes, prop feathering controls, flaps, lighting and a few other things. This green lever down here was for the co-pilot who could manually generate hydraulic pressure by pumping this if there was a failure. And again it's pretty special holding onto the yoke with B29 written on it. Now jumping over to the right is the co-pilot seat. What's interesting is that the Lancaster, for comparison's sake, only had a single pilot because, well sadly, there were so many young men getting killed that they just didn't have enough. The US on the other hand thankfully didn't have that problem. The co-pilot's display was similar although they had no engine information. Again, he had access to the engine throttles if they had to take over, but these were usually the domain of the flight engineer who will visit next and is sitting backwards. Flying in tight formation and before advanced autopilot systems were invented would have been very intense and stressful, hence the need for two pilots to give each other a break and act as another set of eyes. The flight engineer was probably the busiest person both during the flight and on the ground beforehand and probably never received their due respect, although any pilot definitely appreciated a good one. While working away problem solving and ensuring the engines were all running well, they were constantly on call for the pilot to drop everything and carry out their request. On the left, there were the magnetos, emergency hydraulic valve, and fire suppressing system. You've got a whole range of dials here showing different parameters. They used dual use gauges so all four engines could be displayed on two dials just to save space. There were also dials for the electricity generators in the engines as well as the APU. Remember that the systems were all electric with the exception of the hydraulic brakes. Down here are more controls including the engine primers and starters, hydraulic pumps, more electrical buttons and fuel shutoff valves. 
The red levers here could control the fuel mixture and the blue ones were the engine throttles mirroring the ones with the pilot and the co-pilot. And again, a great view of engine three and four. Now this big white thing here is the forward upper turret and 500 round ammunition boxes. At 14 rounds per second, they had a total of 36 seconds of sustained firing per flight, although they could only fire a few seconds at a time to avoid overheating. And sneaking past that is the navigator's position, and I'll stick my head up into the Astrodome, where they could use the sextant to identify the location shortly, as well as by using all the other navigational systems. You've got the lower gun turret here, and then there's the radio operator station. There was an upgraded and re-engined B-50 Super Fortress, although it arrived after the war had finished. It actually was the first aircraft to circumnavigate the world non-stop using air-to-air -air refuelers, taking 94 hours in 1949. Now you saw this tunnel from the Bombay below, and it's the connection between the forward and aft pressurized cabins. It was 35 feet long and looked pretty uncomfortable. Above is that Astrodome, and looking forward you get a brief glimpse of the forward upper turret. And that black blob immediately in front of you was the ADF loop antenna I mentioned earlier, which was one of the navigation equipment. And below that you can see the forward Bombay. This here is the hydraulic tank and it holds up to three gallons of liquid. And then we make our way out of the forward compartment to head to the tail. And while I thoroughly enjoyed crawling around these aircraft, it's important to consider how unpleasant it would have been for the crews during the war. Of the 1,654 B-29s delivered during World War II, 498 were lost in combat or maintenance issues. Three and a half thousand men lost their lives flying these, so there was a 15% death rate for B-29 crews, and it's even more sobering once you consider the much higher death rate for the B-17 and Lancaster crews that I'll mention in their videos. Now let's check out the rear half of the B-29. I'm entering here via the crew entry door, and you can see the pressure bulkhead on the right, so the area I'm now in was not pressurized during the flight. We'll look at it later, but let's go through the bulkhead hatch and check out the aft pressurized compartment. As I struggle to get my 180cm frame through the door, I'll spin around and show you what the closed hatch would look like. And it's interesting to know that while hostile action was suspected, they would actually depressurize the whole plane and rely on crew oxygen, because if there was a small decompression from shrapnel or a bullet, the added pressure escaping could actually rip a much larger hole in the fuselage and bring down the whole plane. Now this is the radar operator station. This orange screen in front gave information from the advanced AP-APQ-13 radar system of which you saw the dome of underneath the aircraft earlier. It was so advanced and secret at the time that the military airbrushed it out of any photos of the aircraft to try and keep it as secret as possible. There would also be crew bunk beds in this spot as well. Immediately in front of you is the aft upper gun turret and again these are remote controlled so there's no one actually inside this and the bulk of it is just the ammunition container. On the right here you get a quick glimpse of the flight control cables so I suppose theoretically if the rear crew wanted to fly somewhere else they could grab these with pliers and turn the aircraft although I'm sure that never actually happened. On the right here is the blister sighting station and the gun sight. Now remember that if a gunner thought that they had a good shot, they could take over multiple turrets remotely, and all of these could then fire at the single aircraft at once. In fact, 969 Japanese interceptors were shot down by B-29s during World War II. And on the opposite side, you have another blister and gunner position. Now this guy up here sitting on the throne was the fire control officer. The seat was also called the barber's chair and could spin around at 360 degrees. He had a blister and a gun sight himself and could take over any other turrets. And swinging down forward at his feet, you've got access to the bomb bay, although obviously this wouldn't open up when the cabin was pressurized. And above that was the crew tunnel. Now let's swing back around again and head towards the rear gunner's turret. Again, we move through the pressure bulkhead and into the unpressurized rear compartment. 
in this spot here was a downward looking oblique camera to assess the damage from bombing as well as obtain photographic information of the enemy. This circular thing here was the upper side of the aft lower gun turret and in-flight ammunition containers would be here as well. On both sides you've got these flight control cables. I'll keep making my way back and it was really difficult. You can only imagine what it was like wearing your flying suit, parachute, communication and oxygen equipment. Remember that the area I'm in now was not pressurized so you'd need the supplemental oxygen if you were here while at altitude. Down here you have the tail skid wheel which would move up during flight as to avoid creating unnecessary drag. And there's more of these yellow oxygen bottles located all around the aircraft. Now the rear gunner was in his own pressurized cabin, although you can see that the door has been removed in this case. You can see his seat here was a crate, and sorry but this is as close as I could get to it, and you can briefly see the gun sight and the bulletproof glass. Now I'll skip over the next few minutes, which was just me crawling and uh, moaning. And here we are back near the crew hatch that we entered with and here is the auxiliary power unit. It was a 10 horsepower mower engine and known affectionately as Putt Putt because that's what it sounded like. It was started before the flight to generate electrical power. Before engine number 3 was started and the generators in all the engines would kick in and provide additional power themselves. The APU would continue operating until they were well into the flight in case there was a failure of one of the engine's generators and then was eventually turned off. It was then turned back on again just prior to landing. There's that bulkhead that we walked through earlier and now I'm stepping outside the crew entry hatch. And here's my extremely undignified exit from this fascinating piece of engineering. A huge thanks to the Pima Air Museum in Arizona for letting me film inside the aircraft. If you enjoyed the video please give it a thumbs up and check out my channel. I've already published tours through a Lancaster and a B-52 while my B-17 video will be online soon. Thanks for watching.